everyone, also if you're watching it on YouTube. Um, one of the things that I've decided actually is that I'm not gonna cut the videos anymore for Moodle and I'm just gonna put them on YouTube and since the recordings are available for two weeks here on Twitch and you can watch them there, it takes me a lot of time to recode everything. Um, I have to use some weird program for it and that it just takes me like three hours of my time to recode it for Moodle because Moodle has like this 500 MB upload limit. Um, so I, I'm really not wanting to spend three hours every week to just cut the lectures for you guys on Moodle. It's not that I don't want to, um, and if you really want me to, then I will do it, but um, I think that since they are available here on Twitch and they are available on YouTube, it makes no sense to waste three hours waiting for the stupid program that kind of burns up my CPU the whole time. Um, so just as a note to you guys. All right, so we talked a little bit about history um, and about how, well, being a type di or being a type one or a type two diabetic would be an automatic death sentence um, only like 120 years ago, and um, it's a very amazing discovery. Um, so not only insulin, of course, but the whole protein field is is amazing, and what we've been able to discover in the last 100 years. All right, so first I want to use some nomenclature, right? So just to know what we're talking about. Um, so an amino acid is a building block and um, there will be like more talks about amino acids and stuff, but an amino acid is a single little molecule um, which is used in the building of a polypeptide. So a polypeptide is a chain of several amino acids. So if I have a single chain of amino acids coupled together, um, or more or less fused together, then this is called a polypeptide. We then have something which is called an apoprotein. So an apoprotein is one or more polypeptides, um, which are more or less held together by several forces, and we will discuss which forces those are. Um, but there is no cofactor. So, and a cofactor is generally a molecule which is not a biomolecule. So it can be a zinc atom or an iron atom or something else. Um, but then, so a, an apoprotein is a non-functioning protein because it doesn't have the cofactor. So it doesn't have the zinc molecule which causes the charge or it doesn't have the iron molecule able to bind um, oxygen. And a protein is then defined as an apoprotein with its cofactors. So with the zinc molecule or with the iron molecule. So just that we got that clear and I will be using apoprotein and protein and polypeptide interchangeably, but they are different. So just as a warning that I probably I'm going to mess it up horribly during the whole lecture. Um, but when we talk about nomenclature, the amino acid is the single building block, the polypeptide is a chain, the apoprotein is one or more polypeptides with no cofactor, and the protein, or when you talk about proteins, then it means apoproteins with their cofactors included. All right, so amino acids are alpha amino carb carboxylic acid, and here we see three of them, or actually two of them, and the general structure of a amino acid. So an amino acid is two carbon atoms and an amino group on the one side and a an carboxylic acid group on the other side. So here we see these, uh, the C double O and the OH, and of course when you dissolve a, um, an amino acid, for example, like glycine, and you put it in water, and then the H falls off. So there's a slight negative charge on this side of the amino acid, and there's a slight positive charge, because the amino acid itself is more or less uncharged, and so this becomes more or less NH3 with one positive charge, and this becomes COO with a small negative charge. Um, so amino acids are chiral, which means that they have um, a left form and a right form, and this is because of the R group here. So if you have glycine, right, you can turn glycine into alanine by instead of having a hydrogen on this side, having a CH3 group, right? So the R here is a carbon atom with three hydrogen atoms coupled to the alpha um, 
amino uh, to the alpha carbon so this is called the alpha carbon and um, the alpha carbon is the thing that we always use so the alpha carbon is the one which has the side chain on it so all amino acids are chiral except for glycine because glycine has a hydrogen on one side and a hydrogen on the other side meaning that no matter how you turn it um, it will always look the same um, but um, if we for example take alanine then alanine has a very specific 3d structure meaning that we can have an L shape and we can have a D shape so and we can have a left and a right kind of handed um, alanine molecule and these two are different from each other not when it comes to the amount of atoms that they have but they are different from each other based on how they can interact with their environment so um, there are around 500 different amino acids which are found in nature so we always talk about 26 essential amino acids but there are many many different amino acids some of them are only produced by certain bacteria um, but you have to remember that almost all naturally occurring amino acids are in the L form and that is very important when you think about uh, about medicine or for example insulin right if you would build insulin from D amino acids instead of L amino acids it would not function these the same because it, it cannot bind to for example the receptor anymore because the the side chains are just pointing in the wrong direction um, so had, um, amino acid is a very simple structure it's two C atoms a, a nitrogen atom and it had one part is an acid and the other part is more or less a, um, a, a base and together of course it's uncharged except for when you have a charged side group um, but the side group can be literally anything so about chirality and this is more or less one of the best pictures that I could find that explains what chirality is right so here we see just the, 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 the alpha or the, the, the main C atom right and here we have then the, the acid group here we have the amino group here we have the side chain and here we have the hydrogen and no matter how you turn this one, you can never make a right one out of it. So this is a left one, and this is a right one. And the best way to think about this is to kind of imagine turning this one right. And if you would turn this one, then as soon as this, as, as you would turn it, then, then it would flip around. So the, it, it's, a, it's a stereo thing, right? It's like a, putting a mirror. And the mirror image left in the mirror image is right for you and and right for the mirror image is left for you and chirality is a difficult subject because like chirality is difficult to understand but i i think that if you think about a mirror standing in front of a mirror um, then heck chirality can be explained as when you raise your left hand then the mirror image actually raises its right hand um, so it from from the perspective of the mirror um, so chirality is very important in amino acids because like I said naturally occurring amino acids all have the left-handed shape form um, while we can also chemically synthesize D amino acids but generally L amino acids are very beneficial because when you make a, a, a medicine and then the medicine needs to be in the L form for your body to kind of hook on to the molecule to have a proper binding and generally the D form of amino acids are very very toxic because your your body can't handle it and it, it will not bind to the thing that you think it binds to so chirality is very important when synthesizing method medicine so in total there are 21 more or less essential amino acids which occur in almost any living creature without these 21 um, you're gonna have a very bad time and we divide amino acids into very different groups so um, the groups are of course based on the side chain and the side chain coupled to the standard more or less amino structure right so we can have for example electro electrically charged side chain so um, we can have positive charge yeah, where we for example have the R group being something like this so we see the amino acid right and this is then the and this little thing is what normally where you would write the R group so here we have the alpha carbon here we have the other carbon for the um, for the uh, 
uh, acid group here we have the amino for the for the base group and then here we have the side chain and if this side chain carries a positive charge then it is a positively charged side chain and some examples of these are arginine histidine and lysine so the arginine histidine and lysine um, molecules are a um, are a are positively charged side chains we also have amino acids which have a negative side chain like aspartic acid or glutamic acid um, and these um, have a negative charge um, it's just the way that it is all right i saw that testosaurus redeemed a digital sketch that's really nice so you saved up 2000 points um, what do you want me to sketch for you because of course like i need to have a topic to sketch so we're gonna take like five minutes and I'm gonna do a, a guinea pig oh my god that's that's one of the hardest things to sketchy as well I'm so bad at sketching animals I knew it I knew it I knew it all right so it's drawing time all right let me uh, actually show you guys the drawing so um, let's see where the pen is and let's just remove what we have so you want to have a guinea pig a guinea pig is really really hard let's let's just start off with drawing some eyes right so if you have some eyes then at least that that's something that we have a guinea pig all right then a guinea pig has a very distinct head shape um, and it has a very distinct nose and mouth as well all right so a guinea pig looks like this because it has this little pig nose otherwise it's not a guinea pig and of course yeah it has big teeth so let's give it at least some big teeth it starts looking like a beaver a little bit like that's that's not really what i wanted to um, but yeah it's a chewing animal right so so the big teeth are something that we we definitely want to have all right then they're very furry right so we have to have a lot of fur um for the guinea pig oh my god this is gonna be so bad do guinea pigs actually have whiskers i think they do right so they probably have like these big whiskers um like a like a rat or a <laughs> this is so terrible <laughs> i know i know i was uh, <laughs> kill it with fire oh my god yeah it's gonna be a horrible guinea pig but at least the guinea pig like it has like things like this right and uh <laughs> i want to offer 2.7k for no guinea pig <laughs> poor guinea pig poor guinea pig all right so it looks kind of like this right and it's very very furry and fluffy and they have different shapes and does it have a tail does a guinea pig have a tail that's a good question i don't know um at least it has feet so no it doesn't have a tail how do you mean it doesn't have a tail like i thought all animals except humans have tails you see them every day in rim yeah but the rim world guinea pigs are very stylized right so Let's give it some feet as well. And then, uh, so what is a very, very, uh, let's pick the nose a little bit bigger. And then we do like a little bit more fur. I had guinea pigs. Yeah, I think that everyone had guinea pigs when they were younger, right? And uh, everyone probably killed like one or two guinea pigs by dropping them. They're very sensitive to being dropped. Even from like small heights, they, they don't survive that. Um, <laughs> if yours had a tail, you definitely had no guinea pig. Definitely not a pigtail, though. Yeah, we can give it a little pigtail just so that it's like a guinea pig, right? All right. So then, uh, and a guinea pig is often found in cages, right? Because they, they, you, you shouldn't let your guinea pig just run wild. So let's just do a little cage structure around the guinea pig so that it has somewhere to live. Uh, of course, we want to do something like this, right? And like, uh, and we make a nice, nice cage for the guinea pig. And then we can also hide some of the the horrible mistakes. All right, good. So let's do something like this, and then we have a guinea pig in a box. And like it's a, <laughs> it's very small. Yeah, guinea pigs are pretty small. All right, so, and then, of course, because it's a very wild animal, it needs to have, like, cages, right? So, like, these bars, so that it cannot escape. So that we can just have it like this. Uh, just make sure that we hide part of the figure just by having some, like, metal bar so that it's behind it. And, of course, like, when you're drawing, you should actually draw from the front to the back. 
school says no tail. Yeah, no, we figured that out, but I, I gave it a little pigtail so that you can see that it's a guinea pig. Oh, all right. So this is this is this is definitely worth your two thousand Denny bucks that you spend on this. Love this. All right, drawing time. I love drawing shit. Makes you really think about what you want to draw. But uh, yeah, starting off with a guinea pig is really, really hard. I'd hope for someone to just come and say like, oh, draw me a tree. Um, so let's give it some blue eyes, right? So blue eyed guinea pig. And then uh, make, a, make a little bit of more color of it. So like, let's do that like, like this. Because they're generally like brownish, right? So that, uh, guinea pig, guinea pig, guinea pig. All right, very good, very good. Now, of course, we don't want to do the teeth, but we need to do this. So like there's a little bit of color so they are a little bit brownish and they are this is the worst guinea pig ever where's the carrot yeah that's a good one because guinea pigs eat carrots right so we can just have like a carrot on the side um, so let's put that here in the in the thing so let's just have a carrot which looks like this and then carrot of course have some green additional leaves so let's make some green leaves for the carrot and of course it needs to have like a feeding tray or something like that for the water. So yeah, we just put a like thing here on the side so that it has water. And then, uh, and of course there's this little funnel so that it can drink from it. And let's put some water in as well. We can have like a guinea pig. All right. There needs to be Anna's hand because she wants to pet it. Well, I don't think that anyone actually wants to pet a guinea pig like this. <laughs> you paid for a guinea pig. <laughs> All right, so what do you think, guys? Is this a beautiful guinea pig or not? It, it, it has all of the features a guinea pig needs. Um, like, it has the eyes of a guinea pig. Like, um, we can actually make the eyes a little bit reddish because they are kind of crazy-ish, right? So we can have like a... A little bit crazy guinea pig. Like, all right, perfect. Looks more like Frankenstein kitty, poor thing. It's something. Yes, yes, I definitely agree. <laughs> Next time a panda, please. Well, if you save up 2,000 points, um, it looks like a caged bee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although a bee doesn't have whiskers, right? So at least it has whiskers and it, it has the, the pigtail. So we can actually make like a, a very orangey pigtail on the back. Um, so let me get like a real pig color. So we have like a really nice guinea pigtail. All right. I hope you're happy, Testosaurus. Like, uh, you're the first one. 2,000 Denny bucks. Here's your beautiful guinea pig. I'll actually sign it as well, so that uh, that you know that, that I made it live for you on stream. All right, so I'll just sign it using my normal signature. And uh, there you go. And it is uh, 2021, right? So it's, uh, and, and let's write down that it's a guinea pig as well. So, guinea pig. <laughs> Good, 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 good. All right. So that's your drawing. Are you proud? I'm proud. I'm proud. Like, I love drawing. So it's good to, to have you guys force me to draw a little bit. All right. So amino acids, right? So amino acids come in different groups. So the first group, group number A, is amino acids with an electri electrically charged side chain. You be it positive, be it negative. The next group of amino acids is group number B, um, which have polar uncharged side chains. So polar means that they are uh, more or less uh, hydrophilic, right? So these amino acids are very good at dissolving in water. And this is because they have these OH groups, which actually make them able to make hydrogen bonds. And so polar uncharged side chains, they don't have a charge, but they are very good with reacting with water. Um, then we have some special cases. So some special cases are, for example, cysteine and selenocysteine. And these are very special because these have this um, um, sulfur atom and the sulfur atom allows them to make bindings to each other. What a waste of time. You mean the, the drawing? The drawing is not a waste of time. Drawings are always, there's always time for a nice drawing. So the, uh, the, the, the S group, so the S molecules, the, um, the sulfur molecules, they allow to bind. So they can make a bridge, so a sulfur bridge, which allows two peptide chains to kind of 
uh, be coupled together. So they are causing two chains to kind of bind to them and be um, connected to each other. Um, we have here one which is glycine. Glycine is a little bit special because it has a relatively uh, high uh, high pKa um, and it just has an NH2. Um, it has no it has no side group, right? So it's just the amino acid without any side group. So glycine, only one which is not affected by stereochemistry, um, which means that the left and the right molecule are the same. And then we have proline, and proline is a little bit different because we see here that we have the carbon atom, right? Then we have the side chain actually folding back on the amino group. So the nice thing about proline is, is that it's flat. So it's kind of a flat surface. So if you think about proteins as being a, um, as being like a, a more or less molecular crane or a molecular uh, machine, then the proline is kind of what gives it um, a, a plane to orient on, right? So proline, because it's a flat uh, amino acid, it, it, it's just something that other amino acids can more or less orient itself towards. So those are special cases. Um, of course, we have, of course, also the opposite of the um, un. un polar uncharged side chains, which are the hydrophilic side chains. We also have a lot of amino acids which have hydrophobic side chains. And of course, these ones are generally, so the, the polar un uncharged side chains are generally found on the outside of proteins because they interact with water. And these ones, the hydrophobic side chains are generally found within the protein. So if you think about a protein as being like a globule, like a, a a ball, then, this, then the outside of the ball is hydrophilic and because it needs to be dissolved in water while the inside of the ball generally is made out of hydrophobic side chains. There's many different ways of, of defining different groups within the amino acids, uh, but the alanine, valine and all of these like tryptophan, uh, they are um, hydrophobic, which means that they don't like water, which means that they are generally found in the inside. And of course the different side chains, they, they have their own um, function and they, they make it so that you can mix and match them like Lego blocks and then build up something which is a, a, a very useful protein. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about um, uh, amino acids. So have for the exam, remember that there are four different types of amino acids. They are charged and charged, of course, comes in two types. Um, then we have the um, hydrophilic we have the hydrophobic, and then we have the special cases, um, and the special cases are mostly uh, the cysteine, so the, the S group here, which allows you to couple multiple chains, multiple polypeptides together into a single molecule. So polypeptides are amino acids which are chained together using uh, peptide bonds, and if you would write them down, um, then they are always written down from the N-terminus at the left to the C-terminus at the right. Right, so we, we write them down, we start off with the first amino acid from the N-terminus, and so here we can see that we have a CH3 side group, and then you can see that the, um, that the acid of the first amino acid is coupled to the um, amino group of the second one. And then we have the second side chain and then the same thing. And these are called peptide bonds. So hemp amino acids are coupled together using peptide bonds to form a polypeptide. So it's very comparable to DNA where we write down the amino acids from the N to the C terminus. In DNA we always write from 5 prime to 3 prime and that's just the way that we kind of determine it. However, in uh, proteins, we can have two cysteines, right? So two of these ones which have um, a sulfur group and these can form disulfide bonds. So two sulfur groups can more or less couple together and what happens is that then the primary structure is not a single flat um, or a single line of, of, of amino acids anymore. Right, so if we would write down, here we see oxy, uh, oxytocin, uh, which is the, the happy molecule. Um, if you would write down the primary structure of cyto oxytocin, not cyto cytotoxin, but oxytocin, if you would write it down, we start at the N-terminus, end at the C-terminus, but because these two cysteines in the molecule coupled together using this uh, disulfide bond, so two sulfur molecules coupling together. This is how you write down the structure. 
So the structure is not like DNA or RNA where you just write ATCGG, ATC. No, the primary structure already has a, a little bit of a, a wiggle or some other things in there. And this is because of the two cysteine bonds. Um, yeah, so ox oxytocin, happy molecule, hey, it has like a couple of amino acids, um, but there is this double uh, this disulfide bond uh, which makes the primary structure not a singular kind of linear thing but it, it has this little hump in there. So when we talk about the primary structure of insulin for example this molecule which is massively important um, is that have, if we have disulfide bonds it, it's possible not only that it's forming bonds within a single peptide but a disulfide bond can also join two polypeptides. And then we have a very complex primary structure already. Right, so what we see here is we see that we write it down from the N terminus to the C terminus. So this is the first, the alpha chain of um, insulin. This is the beta chain of, al uh, of insulin. They, they are different, right? They are just two different polypeptides which come together, but because of these bridges, right, so you see that here there's a disulfide bond behind, between the cysteine of the alpha chain and another cysteine of the alpha chain, but the second cysteine here can couple to the beta chain, and the same thing here. So had the primary structure of insulin, if you would write it down on paper, you would have to write down that there are two chains, right, that these chains have disulfide bonds, and then of course have both of these chains are written down from N terminus to C terminus, but the primary structure is already very, very complex compared to, for example, the primary structure of DNA, which is just AAA, T, C, C, T, G, right, just the, the sequence. So had remember that when you write down proteins and you want to write down the, the primary structure, you already have to deal with the fact that these two um, sulfur molecules can form a disulfide bond. All right, so then the next structural level is the secondary structure. So the secondary structure is the 3D form of local segments of biopolymers. Um, so secondary structure also occurs for RNA, right? We did a secondary structure prediction of RNA um, at the assignments. Um, DNA also has a secondary structure, but for DNA and RNA, that's it. Right? There is nothing above this, this secondary structure. But for proteins there actually is. But in proteins there are two secondary structures which we more or less identify. And those are the alpha helices and the beta sheets. So the structure, the secondary structure in proteins does not describe specific atom positions in a three-dimensional space. No, it just describes that part of the protein will form either a helix or it will form a sheet. So talking a little bit more about alpha helices is that uh, and so a single protein chain in a helical structure is an alpha helix. So hey, it looks more or less, well it doesn't look like this, but the way that we write it down is either using a helix and like we see here and then we see an undetermined part, so a part which is not having any shape and then we see that it couples to a secondary, a second alpha helix and then we have again an unstructured part and then we see that this part now comes into a beta sheet. So but for um, for alpha helices it turns so a single turn of the helix right so you're above the same um, in 3.6 amino acids so every turn of the helix is 3.6 amino acids big and the shape is maintained by having hydrogen bonding between the CO and the HN uh, four amino acids earlier. So the CO group of one amino acid couples to the, uh, makes a hydrogen bond to the HN group of an amino acid four amino acids earlier. So there's two ways of showing an alpha helix when in a 3D diagram or in a secondary structure diagram for proteins and that is using a helix which is more or less how it's depicted here but in a lot of cases people use the toilet roll representation. So the toilet roll representation is like this. So here we can see the different alpha helices. So if we would just count then this protein here has one, two, three small alpha helices and one, two, three, four bigger alpha helices, so longer alpha helices. Furthermore, it seems to have one, two beta sheets, which are the, the arrows. So remember that the amino acid side chains 
are on the outside of the helix, so they point outwards. And not only do they point outwards, but they always point towards the end terminus of the protein. So it's a helix, and every time there is a side chain of each of the amino acids, they point outwards, but kind of towards um, the end terminus. So I have a figure uh, of that as well. So what we see here is we see then the, um, the, the, uh, the, the C being coupled to the N, right? So this is a peptide bond. Here we see the alpha, and then the side chain is here. So the side chain sticks out to the outside of the helix, um, but it also always points towards the N terminus of the um, of the of the peptide. Yes, peptide is okay here. Um, hey, and then we see another one, another one, another one, and another one, and then four four amino acids later, we see that there's a hydrogen bridge between the NH group of the four amino acids earlier compared to the current amino acids that we're looking at. Right? So an alpha helix is a very very structured part of a protein and its structured part of the protein is there because we have hydrogen bonds. So had the primary structure of a peptide is determined by atomic bonds like a, a disulfide bond or a peptide bond, the secondary structure like alpha helices are determined by hydrogen bonds. So a different force is responsible for keeping this into an alpha helical structure. We also have beta sheets, the other secondary structure. Again, it is a flat structure kept in place by hydrogen bonds, and it is two strands of a polypeptide that fold back on itself. So here we see, for example, an antiparallel beta sheet, um, and we see that this is one part of the peptide chain, which then turns and loops around and comes back through the other side. So it is more or less, again, a flat surface, um, and had there are two important forms. They are parallel or anti-parallel. I already told you that they are shown in an, as an arrow when we look at a, third, uh, a tertiary structure of a protein. Um, but have what you have to remember is that for the anti-parallel sheet, um, what happens is that the side chains are pointing towards each other, and then they are pointing away from each other and then they are pointing again towards each other and away from each other. So of course you can imagine that when you have an anti-parallel beta sheet that these side chains cannot be too long. Because if you have very long side chains then of course they start hitting each other and they start interfering with each other when you have an anti-parallel beta sheet. This is different from when you have a parallel beta sheet because when you have a parallel beta sheet the two side chains point towards the same direction. Right, so they point towards the left side, then the next one points towards the right side, and both of them do. Right, so you have side chains which point in the same direction. And of course, based on the anti-parallel or being parallel, um, they can have different shapes. One of the things that you can see here is, is that the hydrogen bond in an anti-parallel sheet is much closer, so it's much tighter than in a parallel sheet. So parallel beta sheets are not as tightly bound together as an anti-parallel sheet. Of course, this also depends on the length of the sheet, right? So it's just a, a, a polypeptide which folds back on itself. And because of hydrogen bridging, it forms a kind of sheet-like structure. So a, a more or less a plane in 3D. All right, so how do we determine if a protein has alpha helices or beta sheets, well, this is where Ramachandran plots come in. So Ramachandran plots are plots of the torsion angles of the residues contained in a peptide. So we have, so here we have again a polypeptide chain, right? So we see um, the N being coupled to the alpha C atom. Right? Um, and then we have the C with the O, which is then coupled to the next. So this is the peptide bond here, and here we see the other peptide bond, and this is the one which has the side chain. Right? So this is, this is determined by C beta. So here we see that if we look at the alpha atom, we have a rotational angle of the nitrogen atom relative to the C alpha atom. And we also have the phi angle a psi angle, so we have the phi angle and we have the psi angle, which are the two angles which determine how much stress there is in the amino acid. And if we if we determine if we can determine the um, the angles, then we can plot the phi angle on the x-axis, which is the n 
see alpha bond or we can plot and we can plot the psi on the y-axis and that is the C alpha C bonding right so the secondary C which is there um, this method was developed in 1963 by Ramagandran and that's why it's called a Ramagandran plot um, and there are online tools available to generate them from uh, a PDB file right so if you do an experiment and you do an x-ray crystallography experiment um, then in the end what you get if you if you if you have so the machine does the x-ray experiment then you get your electron density map then within the electron density map you fit your polypeptide in there and then once you have this this structure right so once you have this 3d structure um, you can use um, this PDB file which stores the atomic coordinates of each of the atoms um, just upload it here and then it will generate a Ramagandran, a Ramagandran plot for you so how does a Ramagandran plot look like? Well, a Ramagandran plot looks more or less like this. This is more or less a kind of schematic representation. Um, so it shows the favorite regions in dark green and the allowed regions in light green from the torsion angles in alpha helices and beta sheets. Right, so if we have a right-handed alpha helix, we see that the phi angle is around minus 45, while the psi angle is also around minus 45 degrees. Right, so however, if we see that the uh, phi angle is actually different, right, if it's plus 90 degrees to around 135 degrees, while the psi angle is around like 90, head, then we see that we have a parallel beta sheet which shows up here. An anti parallel beta sheet should, would show up here, and we have a collagen helix which we don't care about much, but that's like a third secondary structure that there is that's the collagen helix uh, which is over here if we have a left-handed alpha helix then the left-handed alpha helix is a positive 45 phi angle and a positive 45 degree uh, phi angle so based on this we can determine if it's if if inside of the protein we have alpha helices if this is a right or a left-sided alpha helix or if we have a beta sheet which is parallel or anti-parallel um, Oh crap, I thought I had a real thing, a, a real one, because hey, normally you make these plots and then these plots don't look more, it, they, these are the areas where you can determine, hey, but when you, when you upload one of these structures, then this structure will give you, for, it'll give you each amino acid will be plotted on here and then you can see, oh, like amino acid 50 to 60, they form an alpha helix, because you see like 10 points here, right, so the, the, it, the plot looks like little numbers and so every amino acid from beginning to end has a number and then the numbers are plotted on this plot and then you can see oh like 10 to 25 is a right-handed alpha helix um, 50 to 73 is a left-handed alpha helix so and you can generate these plots from PDB structures um, so you can kind of investigate which part of the protein is um, in which configuration or in which 2D configuration. I thought I had a real one, but um, just go here, right? Just go to the PDB, so to the protein database, um, download your favorite protein from there, uh, throw it into this tool, and then it will generate one of these plots for you. And then you can indeed see that part. Hey, if you take a protein which consists only of alpha helices, hey, then most of the numbers will be in this area, hey, because then, or in this area, because it might be a, a left or right-handed side alpha helix. But hey, that's, that's how you can kind of figure out what the secondary structure of a protein is, um, just based on the, on the location of the atoms. All right, so one level higher, we have the tertiary structure. So the first, so the primary structure is based on atomic bonding. The secondary structure is based on hydrogen bridges, right? So uh, again, a relatively strong atomic force. Um, but the tertiary st structure of the protein is its three-dimensional structure as defined by the atomic coordinates. Right, so the 3D structure is really how the thing looks in, in real life. Um, and had the forces on the tertiary structure that keep the tertiary structure in place is because there is ionic bonding, so a positive side chain bonding with a negative side chain. Uh, there can, of course, be hydrogen bonding as well. So hydrogen bonding also plays a role at the third level, but generally hydrogen bonding structure consists 
of the second level. Then we have things like hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions, right? So how does the protein, when it when it hits water, how does the how do the hydrophobic parts kind of clump together, and how do the hydrophilic parts make it dissolve in water? And of course the disulfide bonds. But the disulfide bonds and the hydrogen bonding, these and so the disulfide bonds are the primary structure. Hydrogen bonding is secondary structure, and then for the tertiary structure, you also consider ionic bonding, so positive side chains with negative side chains, and you in, and you also consider the hydro, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions. Um, so how does this generally look? Well, it generally looks somewhat like this. So here you see that this protein has a lot of beta sheets and it has a, a, a massive alpha helix um, and had the, the way that it's structured is like this. And this now has a relationship to the real positions of the atoms in the protein. When we talk about quaternary structure, so one level higher, then we talk about the arrangement of multiple proteins or coiling proteins in a multi subunit complex with the cofactor. So here we still talk, for tertiary structure, we still talk about peptide chains, so singular or two peptide chains coupled with uh, disulfide bonds or three coupled with disulfide bonds. But when we have, when we talk about the quaternary structure, we talk about proteins, um, which are, for example, hemoglobin, which you see here. And so hemoglobin has four different polypeptide chains, two times an alpha chain, two, two times a beta chain. So the beta chains are in, um, in red and the alpha chains here are in blue. But here you also see the um, structures of the proteins surrounding the four iron molecules. So they are the, the, the thing that makes hemoglobin able to kind of attach an oxygen molecule or attach four oxygen molecules because every hemoglobin molecule binds four atoms of oxygen and it does that because it has these four iron uh, ions in there. And those, those are depicted more or less here um, with their kind of structure that holds these iron atoms um, in place. So quaternary structure is different from tertiary structure because it doesn't consider a single polypeptide chain or polypeptide chains which have been fused or linked together using disulfide bonds. No, it, it consists of how different poly of apoproteins come together and form the real protein. I hope that's clear. First level, second level, third level, fourth level. All right, so and because the structure is very, 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 very important when we talk about proteins, right? Because proteins can only function because of their structure. So there are many different computational tools to, ex to predict protein structure, be it secondary structure, be it tertiary structure, be it, be it a, a quaternary structure. So these tools can be divided into five different groups. And of course, there are also tools which are kind of borrowing from two or more groups. Um, but the first group is the up initio prediction. So that means that you predict the secondary or tertiary protein structure just from the sequence of the amino acids. Then we have secondary structure prediction. So secondary structure prediction predicts alpha helices and beta sheets, for example, by using rachman rachman plots. Um, hey, then we have, for example, also a transmembrane helix prediction. So that will predict if an alpha helix is actually going through a lipid membrane. Um, then we have thread and folding recognition algorithms, which um, work based on um, previously learned structures from other proteins which have a structure. And then there's also homology modeling, which uses knowledge about the 3D structure of other related proteins to predict the structure of the protein that you're currently looking at. Um, so different structure prediction tools. We will run through a couple of these categories just to show you some of the tools that, that are in this group and um, how they are called and where you can use them. So up initial prediction, like I said, is an algorithm uh, is an algorithmic process by which a protein tertiary structure is predicted from its primary sequence. So you give it the primary sequence, so just the basic amino acid um, um, order, and then uh, what it will try to do is predict how the tertiary structure of the protein will look like. 
So the head of computer will model the hydrogen bridges, the disulfide bonds, but it will also try to figure out the um, the ionic forces, and it will also try and figure out the um, what was the fourth force? I always forget that one. Hydrophobic interactions. Actually, the fourth level, and I forgot to tell you guys this. This is based on Van der Waals force. So Van der Waals force is the force that applies to things when you put it in water that things kind of like to clump together. Um, so, but up in each your prediction is still one of these remaining unsolved questions in biology. No one can really do it. Um, there are some programs that try to do it, um, but it is one of the top 125 outstanding issues in modern computer science. So you can become like world famous by solving um, or by writing an algorithm, which when fed, the primary sequence of amino acids predicts the protein tertiary structure. So the atomic location of each of the, or of the, of each of the atoms within the protein. There are some tools that do this. One of my favorite is folding at home, um, which is um, part of the Berkeley um, kind of ecosystem. So the Berkeley ecosystem started years ago with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. I think that most people know what SETI is. If you don't know what SETI is, definitely Google it. Um, what what it does is that it uses computers, like my computer and your computer, you install a program on it, and what the program does, it contacts one of the Berkeley servers and asks for a job. So in the old days when like, I started computers, um, which is, well, very old, but in like the 19, 1995, you had the first SETI program. So what they did is they have all of these radio telescopes all around the world, and in these radio telescope recordings, they look for ex messages sent by extraterrestrials. So what they would do is you would just get, for example, five minutes of recording sent to your computer. You compute if there is a signal in there, and then you send your results back. And by doing this, by using thousands and thousands of computers all over the world, um, they hope to find extraterrestrial life. This infrastructure is also nowadays used for folding proteins. So what happens is, is that they want to fold, for example, a very big protein, so everyone gets a little piece of it, right? So your computer gets like 15 amino acids. And then on these 15 amino acids, it, it tries to simulate all of these different forces, disulfide bonds and these kinds of things. So folding at home is a project where you can contribute your excess computer time hey, when you're not playing computer games or streaming online or, or doing other things with your computer hey, the computer can actually help fold proteins. Folding at home, um, same as SETI at home, um, uses the same infrastructure, really interesting uh, project by uh, Berkeley University. Foldit is a different approach. Foldit is a computer game for your mobile phone where you are sneakily folding proteins and earning points for it because uh, like two side chains are not allowed to touch each other um, and two hydro uh, a hydrophobic side chain will never kind of be close to a hydrophilic side chain and since humans are very good at this the idea of folded was like let's make an app for people on their mobile phone so that we can use all of the brain power of people that is out there to have them help us solve proteins and structures. So what you do is you, you just install the Foldit app um, and then you get uh, little puzzles. And these puzzles are like rotate um, this little molecule so that it's um, in the best configuration. So the least amount of stress, right? So that two, two hydrophobic chains are not pointing towards each other. So, and this is a really interesting project um, because Foldit actually made some massive contributions to uh, protein prediction or up initial prediction for proteins. Because what they did is they, they studied how people solve these different puzzles that they get and then try to abstract uh, the, the kind of algorithm which people run in their mind to kind of extract that and put that back into a computer. Um, and then there's also the human proteome folding project, which is a big project set up by all kinds of university to do um, protein folding. Um, but I think that the folding at home yeah, just contributing excess computer power that you have to solve uh, to to help people fold proteins and fold it which is a really interesting like 
approach where you're just using a, a, an, an app um, with a game and hey, you have people play the game and people well they know that they're folding proteins but like the idea is just that it's just a fun game so hey, you solve it as quickly as possible and you get points for how good your folding of the protein was so up in your prediction still an unsolved question one of these things that if you are able to solve this yeah, then you will become one of the most famous computer scientists in modern history so secondary structure prediction is more or less a, a solved problem right so going from the primary structure to the secondary structure is relatively easy because you only have to take into account the um, the atomic binding right so um, the disulfide bonds and the other thing that you have to take into account is the hydrogen bridging so only two out of four forces you have to take into account currently we can predict local secondary structures so not the whole secondary structure but locally like if you if you give a uh, if you have a protein which is a thousand amino acids long and you then zoom in on like 20 of them then we can with an 80 percent accuracy predict if this is an alpha helix a beta sheet or a collagen helix um, so that is more or less a solved problem and there are some tools out there when you want to do local secondary structure prediction uh, like raptor x and simpret and uh, yas just another uh, secondary structure protein predictor that's the name so um, yet no it's yet another secondary structure protein predictor um, so and that, that those are different computational tools which you can feed um, your amino acid sequence and then it will look at parts of this protein yeah, so it will just more or less um, do a sliding window through the protein and for each of these windows predict what is the chance that it's an alpha helix what is the chance that it's a beta sheet and then it will give you this secondary structure prediction and then we can do that with around 80% accuracy. If we want to predict transmembrane helices, which is a little bit different because those are alpha helices, which have hydrophobic side chains on the side so that they can integrate um, into uh, membranes. So hey, like they form like these pores um, on the side of the cell um, or they, they form like these um, pores which allow like transport of electrons and other stuff from the inside of the cell to the outside um, so it, this is also a relatively solved issue we can kind of predict with like 60 to 80 percent accuracy if something is going to be a transmembrane helix um, because we know how how thick a lipid bilayer is and we know how an alpha helix should look like so that it that it it punches a hole um, through um, the cell wall um, you can use HMM top which uses hidden Markov models there's memsat uh, which uses neural network um, we have phobias which uses homology prediction so it, it, it is a, a model trained on homologous proteins where we know that they are having transmembrane helices and then we can have like think tools like CC top which are constrained consensus topology um, so had they used like known topology and they constrain there and they do a consensus voting on so it's kind of a machine learning approach as well. All right, 303, let's see, what's the next one? Let's do an example. Um, good, um, let me actually show you guys the example and then um, I'm gonna um, just have it run during the break. Um, so we'll have a 10 minute break. So for example, let's do a structure prediction of the human insulin receptor using CC top. Right, so uh, the first thing that we do is we click the link and we go to Firefox. Um, so that's actually the other Firefox. Right, so here we see the insulin receptor. Hey, it, it shows you all of the different types and sites. So, and, and this is the, the, the protein structure. Um, so the, prote ah, the protein, the amino acid sequence of the protein. Um, but of course we want to have it in FASTA format. So we click on FASTA and then it just gives us the FASTA file, which is just the amino acid sequence of the insulin receptor for human. Um, then we go to the CC top prediction tool. And that should open up or not. It doesn't open up. Ah, come on. There we go. All right. So the only thing that we do is we just take the FASTA sequence, right, from uh, NCBI. We just throw it in CC top, and then uh, we just say submit. Good. 
So this is all that you do, and now it's doing its work. So it uh, it it well, we're in the queue, um, but after we're out of the queue, it will show us what it predicted for our secondary structure um, for CC top. All right, I'm going to take a break. This time it is going to be sloth, I hope. So um, I will stop the recording. So.